gospel reading, read just a few moments ago, the gospel according to St. John, chapter 14, verses 30, 23 through 31. Please join me in prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and we shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit instructs the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolations through Christ our Lord. You may be seated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. What an exciting day, not only that first Pentecost, but everyone afterwards, when we get to remember how God has come to touch each one of us with the love of Jesus. It's not just those who walked with him long ago, but you and I walk with him even now. We may not see him in flesh and blood, but we do see him as he works through his word, as lives are transformed, as hearts are changed. And it's only the Holy Spirit who can change a heart and turn it from what is not of God to God himself. Jesus, in our text, sets the priorities right from the beginning. He says, whoever loves me will keep the commandments. In other words, whoever loves me is not going to necessarily be like having their nose to the grindstone and groaning through life to make sure that they never step out of line. But whoever loves me, Jesus, the one who is on his way to the cross at this point, Jesus, who indeed takes our sins to the cross and gives to us life, whoever believes in him knows the forgiveness of sin and walks with a joy in their heart as they walk together with him in the ways that he would have us to walk. Some people make Christian life such a drudgery. And so many people turn it into something that you really have to work hard at. And don't get me wrong, you do need to pay attention and it does require a little bit of work. But you know what? It's God who has done the work and God who continues to do the work. We can only do the things of God if we are empowered by the Spirit of God. And so, is it really all my work? Or do I just get to be involved as the Lord makes use of me, as he changes my heart, and as he fills me with that message of salvation, as he gives to me that message of peace and sends me out into the world to be his reflection and to share, even as he has so freely given to me? Jesus sets the priorities, and that's important for us here on Pentecost. Pentecost is a day when we focus not only on the Holy Spirit, but on the Spirit's gathering together of the people of God, the enlivening of souls that were dead and have been called to life. So what are our priorities? What is it in your life? What or who is it that you love most? What or who is it? that you spend the most time thinking about, that you rejoice the most about? What is the priority in your life? What's important to you? Well, we could list out a number of things, couldn't we? Well, obviously, yeah, that's the way it is in life. There's a number of things. But how do you prioritize those? The Lord makes it clear in our text and throughout the Gospels the apostles throughout the epistles set before us the very same thing. That the number one priority is what we heard all the way back in the beginning at the time of creation. And it was announced again boldly at the time of the giving of the law on Sinai. The number one priority is that the Lord God should be number one in our life. That he has to be the most important and that, my friends, is where we struggle every single day. We struggle with that very thing. There are other things that we allow to intervene. There are other things that we come to God about and we say that they're so important that they take up all of my time and I don't have time 
to come to worship. I don't have time to be involved with Sunday school. I don't have time for a home Bible study. And you know, I really don't have time for home personal reading of the scriptures. I really don't have time for praying. After all, what good is that going to do me? I can do that while I'm on the run. Yes, you can. But do you? That is an important point. You see, within the Lutheran Church, we have always valued memory work as well. Some of us grew up under a crush of it. Today, except in the school, it's very hard to get people to do memory work. There just doesn't seem a drive for that. But when you get busy, when you are overwhelmed with the things of the world, when you have no time to even think, it is those things that you have memorized that will come back to you. I'll give you one example. I remember when I was much younger and I was only a passenger. I was riding in my grandmother's car, my sister was driving, and there was black ice. We hit it and we did a 360 and both of us, just like that, our hearts were almost stopped and it was like, that's a deep ditch on both sides. But what was it that came to my mind as soon as we started to spin? It was the words of scripture that we had sung in the liturgy since I was able to even stand. It was those things that had been repeated to me over and over and which I myself, together with the other people of God, had repeated over and over so that it was deeply ingrained in my heart and my mind. And when I needed that comfort, it was there in a snap, less than a snap, in the twinkling of an eye. That is what we need in life. That is perhaps why so many people who call themselves Christians struggle because they don't have that reservoir. It's more than just a high and holy festival or a celebration here and there. It's a daily thing. Why? Because the Lord's love for you is daily. And that leads us to our second P of Pentecost. We have our priorities and the Lord must be number one. But let's talk about another part of Pentecost, another part of Christ and the giving of the Spirit of Christ and his resurrection. It is the P of potential. The Lord did not choose you because he saw what you could be. And we always have to remember that. He doesn't look at you and say, well, I'm going to love you now because down the road you're going to be lovable. No. He loves us in all of our sin. He, lives a, he loves us completely and thoroughly stained with the stench of sin. He loves you always. And so he has sent his son to bear that sin, to reconnect you with God that you might know him and believe in him and rejoice in him and walk with him, that it might be a daily thing, even as it was for our first parents, Adam and Eve, before the fall into sin ever happened. They walked with the Lord daily. They knew what it sounded like. And so, having been tempted, having given in to temptation, they heard him walking in the garden. They knew who he was. And they hid themselves. But the Lord does not allow us to hide. Because he loves you too much. Did you catch that? He loves you too much to let you hide. He comes and pursues you and seeks you out and calls to you regularly. Even as he did Adam Vobistu. Adam, where are you? Because we all know the scriptures were written in German, right? Adam, where are you? And what did Adam still try to do? Oh, it wasn't me. It was her. You made her. It's your fault. And down the line, if you look throughout the scriptures, you find 
that it is just like little children with the excuses that we give. And some of you, I was just talking about this last week with somebody, you know, the making of the golden calf. I just love when Aaron is confronted with it because he sounds just like our kids when they have chocolate all around their face, the cookie jar is on the floor broken, and we say, did you do this? And they say, no. What does Aaron say? I don't know. They brought their gold. We threw it in fire and out popped this calf. <laughs> yeah. And we have to laugh because all of our excuses are just as lame. But the Lord loves you. And that is the message of the gift of Jesus Christ and the gift of his life. That is the message that the Holy Spirit brings to us through word and touches even our bodies with in the word attached to water, bread, and wine. He gives to us that very love. He fills the emptiness of our hearts with his presence. And let me tell you, as we walk through life, we need to be refilled on a regular basis. There are many people who struggle in life. And eventually, not usually as early as they used to, which was still a long time, but eventually they may turn to the church. Pastor, I don't know what's going on in my life. I try to do the right thing. You see, it's not about your trying. It's about God loving you. But now that we're beyond that point, where do you suppose you need to go in order to have the power to live the life that he has called you to? Well, to the one who called you. And so they come back. They're going through hard times, and they begin studying the scriptures and praying. They even show up at communion once in a while. And then everything seems fine. And like so many people who have continuing illnesses, Oh, I feel good. I don't need to take that medicine anymore. And before long, the question is, are you taking your medication? That question needs to be asked of us with regard to the gospel, the law which breaks our hearts and convicts us always, and the gospel that lifts us up, washes us clean, sets us on a firm rock, David said, so that we might serve the living God because we rejoice in his salvation. See, that's what we got to get right. We got to get it straight that it's his work, his love, then our response. We don't just do these things and then God says, well, now I can love you. Mm -mm. The whole of scripture tells us something far different. It reaches out. And it embraces us with the message of peace in Jesus Christ. Peace because of sins forgiven. That's where all the woes came from. That's where struggle, disease, death, even those thorns and thistles and dandelions in my yard, they all came and became a nuisance because of the fall into sin. And so sin must be dealt with. And that is what our Lord Jesus Christ has done. He has taken our sin to himself and he has become a curse for us. Become sin itself, the Apostle Paul says, there on the tree of the cross to take our, your punishment, our punishment. He has done it all, as the New Testament says so joyfully and simply, to bring you to God. But I don't know if I'm good enough. I don't know if I'm right to come to God. You don't have to worry about that. He welcomes sinners. And guess what? We never get away from that. We're always sinners. His arms are always stretched out to welcome sinners. The Father invites sinners to come to him. Here in these pews, take a look around. Every one of you, me, a sinner. The church is not for the righteous and holy on their own. The church is for sinners. And we are made right and we are holy by the work of Jesus Christ and by the application of his blood to our lives. 
that our sin may be washed away and we may be enlivened. Now that peace flows farther than just in our relationship with God. If that peace fills us, that peace that only God can give, then it's going to be reflected in our lives. Peace is not the absence of conflict, but it is that quiet confidence and ability to cope in the midst of it all because we know that we have been and are loved and that the Lord is with us and will lead us. And no matter how the dark the road may become, there is nothing that can overpower our Lord. He already defeated Satan and all of his hosts and the sin that he brings and the death that that brings. So what is there that can stand up against him? Not a thing. And what about you? If his spirit fills you, what is it that can defeat you? Here we need to talk about our priorities again, don't we? We can meet, make all of those priorities. And we can meet more than the potential we ever imagine. We can go leaps and bounds beyond when it is Christ who works in and through us. He is the power. He is the strength. He is the one who pours out his spirit abundantly that we might live in that power each day. And what for? So that we can proclaim. So that we can proclaim the praise of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. That means walking with him in peace and joy. That means coming to him as a wretched sinner and knowing that he will forgive us and by the power of his spirit assist us in trying to do a better job. That he will lead us and that he will guide us. Our proclamation is first and foremost about our Lord and the good news of his love for all sinners. And that's where we come in. That proclamation is summed up beautifully at the very end of our text when Jesus says, rise, let us go from here. We come and we are fed, we are forgiven, we are empowered, and we go. Not in our own strength, but as the cross led us into worship, so too it leads us out into the world so that the world might know by our words, by our deeds, by our very life, that we are Christ followers, that he dwells within us, and he longs to bring them into his kingdom. Set the priorities. See the great potential that there is when the Holy Spirit is fully involved in your life. Come to him that he might remove all of those barriers. Receive that peace that removes the sin and gives us the ability to truly live. Welcome that power from on high, that the goodness of God might be proclaimed in your heart, in your life, and in the world, wherever you go, that Jesus may be made known. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.